I recall St. Paul in one of his letters, um, I mean, it escapes me exactly where it is, I can track it down one of these days, and you probably could Google it instantly, uh, but Paul says basically, pray always. And there is something powerful about the exhortation of Paul the Apostle urging the early Christian community to have unceasing prayer. And I'll never forget when I was a teenager, uh, the pastor at Sacred Heart Church in Lawrenceburg uh, wanted, uh, he always inspired me by his prayerfulness. And, and I saw he was close to the Lord, he seemed very close to the people. And so I really, that, that inspired me to think about priesthood. But the question I had was how much he prayed each day, because I was trying to figure out what was a good amount of prayer each day. So one day I finally said to him, I said, Father, I said, how much do you pray every day? And he said, Brother Mark, my whole life is a prayer. <laughs> and I was like, that didn't really answer my question. You know? But one of the things that I've learned is that if we don't pray, if we don't take set times apart to be with God, then our life will never become a prayer. But if we do faithfully take time to be with the Lord in different ways, our life will eventually become a prayer. So that's the difference uh, between our life being a prayer or not being a prayer. And uh, what is it to make of one's life a prayer? Well, I suppose in some ways uh, the fundamental mystery is that we're never apart from God. God is always present in our life. So to the extent that we turn our hearts and minds into the presence of God and respond in love uh, to the needs of the day, do we live a life in prayer? But I will also be speaking a little bit about how early Christians began to sanctify or make holy uh, the experience of time. And uh, one of the best ways, by the way, to experience it, how many of you all have been uh, for a retreat or an overnight or two in a monastic setting like uh, St. Meinrad or Gethsemane, okay? Great, so if you've been to any of those monasteries and you've joined those communities for their communal prayer, throughout the day or night, you've gotten a taste of how early Christians began to mark the day with prayer. So um, if you go up to St. Meinrad, I, I consider them the more moderate or reasonable in their prayer. I think their morning prayer starts at something like 5.30 or something in the morning. It seems sort of reasonable to me to do that. And then they have uh, midday prayer and they have evening prayer or vespers and then they have night prayer about 7 or 8 o'clock. But the Trappists in Gethsemane, I mean, they are rigorous about it. They get up at 3 o'clock in the morning or something. So the first hour of prayer for them begins at what I would call the middle of the night. But let's, let's look for a moment how Christians sanctify prayer. There were what we would call hinge hours of prayer. So morning prayer and evening prayer were the two hinge or cardinal hours of the day. So the idea was that when we rise in the morning and begin our day, that our day should always begin with prayer. And uh, there's something uh, fundamental about that. As we wake in the morning, that the beginning of our day should be given to God in praise and thanks for a new day that dawns. Uh, and, you know, for lay people in the Catholic Church, this has been preserved in its most simple form in something that we call the morning offering. So when I get out of bed in the morning, I offer myself to God for the day. And there are so many different varieties that that prayer has been put to words. But the core sentiment about morning prayer is basically, thank you God for this new day. And my desire today is to allow you, God, to guide my day according to your will. Help me to live in such a way today that I give you praise and thanks. And don't allow me to deviate from your will for me today. So that's sort of in my own words of the essence of our morning prayer at the beginning of the day. So uh, what I'm speaking of, by the way, is how the liturgy of hours developed. So those of you who know anything about the liturgy of the hours, how many of y'all have prayed the liturgy of the hours in a somewhat regular way? So it is the official prayer of the church. You know, we don't have a lot of quote unquote official prayer, uh, but the liturgy of the church is the official prayer, and that's, that includes the liturgy of the hours. 
So the rosary is a devotion, but it's not the liturgy of the church. It's a very wonderful way to pray, but again, it's not the same as the official liturgy. So uh, when you begin your morning with the liturgy of the hours, and the entire liturgy of the hours, by the way, structuring the day in prayer, uses as its fundamental core content the 150 Psalms of the Old Testament. Why is that significant? Well, it's the oldest collection of prayer book, of a prayer collection in our entire Jewish Christian tradition. So 3,000 years ago, uh, the origins of the time of King David, and some of the Psalms you know, may reflect even more ancient prayers of God's people that preceded King David that were collected and put into writing through the centuries. So uh, those are the ancient prayers that we've been praying for almost 3,000 years. Uh, when you stop and think about it, Jesus, as a faithful Jew, they would have also been his prayer book. And so he would have prayed the Psalms of the Old Testament. And when you look at the Psalms with some attentiveness, uh, they represent the whole of human existence before the face of God. So there's nothing that we ever experience that the Psalms don't capture in terms of the fundamental movements of the human heart. So you have psalms that rejoice and give God praise and thanks. You have songs of, psalms of lamentation that are crying out to God, why, God, is this happening to me? You know, why am I so ill? Why do my enemies surround me like a pack of evildoers? You have psalms that express uh, yearnings for God's forgiveness. Have mercy on me, God. Uh, my heart is humble and contrite. Uh, you have psalms even that express wrath and anger toward one's enemies. Oh, how I wish that you would, it's awful, but we don't have those, in, they don't include them, by the way, in order to us. How would you would bash their babies against the rocks, you know? And so these sentiments that express really every single emotion or passion that the human person is capable of, they get reflected in the mirror of the Psalms. So why would that include so many different things? Like, my God, oh my God, why have you abandoned me? And, and bash their babies against the rocks because all of these are human experiences and if we don't bring them before the face of God, they cannot be redeemed and somehow whole made in us the process of becoming holy or whole or entire. So the Psalms are really a book of the human heart before the face of God. So, and they've been prayed by the church now for almost 2,000 years and uh, there was no time of the day or night where somewhere on our planet, the Psalms are not being recited or chanted somewhere on planet Earth. So the Liturgy of the Hours as the world moves around and around the sun is unfolded. The praises of God are always rising up. So there's never a time when this doesn't happen. So when we think about it that way, uh, because the church is now spread throughout both hemispheres and also in the North and South all around the globe, uh, the, the people of God, uh, all, how many billion Catholics are there, a billion and a half or something, billion Christians, you know, the praises of God are rising up uh, all over our planet continuously. So uh, the Liturgy of Hours is something that unfolds over time. Morning prayer typically takes about 15 minutes to chant, so three sections of psalms or psalm-like material from the Old Testament often an opening hymn, a little short reading of scripture, uh, the morning canticle, which is the canticle of Zechariah, which uh, Zechariah gave praise to God at the time of the birth of his son, John the Baptist, and that's the morning canticle of the church every single day. And then you've got some uh, intercessory prayer, and then the Lord's Prayer kind of wraps it up in a final prayer of a blessing. So that's the essence of the structure of both morning and evening prayer. Evening prayer, though, includes the canticle of Mary, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. So, so in that sense, morning and evening prayer are the hinge hours. So morning prayer is you get up in the morning. Evening prayer designed for the time of day when the day's work is ended and you've arrived at home and uh, at, before electricity, it was the time of the lighting of the lamps and candles to illumine the evening as the sun began to set. So morning prayer as you get up, evening prayer at day's end of work. So these are the cardinal hours. And um, uh, then the monks realized, of course, that those are not just the only hours of prayer, even if they are the cardinal hours, 
So at midday, before they would have the midday meal, they would stop for noonday prayer. I put two small blocks between midday prayer and morning prayer and evening prayer because in mid-morning they would also take a brief break in the midst of their work uh, to do mid-morning prayer and then around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, mid-afternoon prayer. So St. Benedict, when he wrote his Rule of Life for Monks, the Rule of St. Benedict, and organized one of the early Western community of, of uh, monks. And by the way, monks were not religious people. They were in the sense of they were not ordained people. They were not priests or bishops initially. The, the movement of monasticism began uh, on the part of lay people like yourselves, who as the Roman Empire was growing and Christianity was becoming accepted, felt that the intensity and fervor of the Christian life was being lost. Now that it's no longer something you could die for to be a Christian, they wanted to live the Christian life in an exemplary way. So many of these lay people uh, left behind civilization to try to get away from uh, the corrupting influences of that society, and they'd go out to Egypt into the deserts, and they would be alone with God. So the word monasticism the word mono, which means one, to be alone with the alone, to be alone with God in the wilderness. That didn't work very well for a long, by the way, because you have some strange things. Have you ever heard about the pillar saints? Yes. So they got on a pillar of rock, and uh, they'd stay on the pillar as a penitential act out in the wilderness, but of course someone had to carry them food and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a penance for other people, too. But, you know, the other thing that happened was, you know, uh, and Anthony is a good example. St. Anthony of Egypt, one of the most famous, who went out to the desert to be alone with God. He lived a long time. A figure of solitude keeps you away from germs. It must do something good for you. Uh, but, you know, after a while, God won't let a hermit be alone. So people were drawn to him uh, for spiritual direction. They wanted to go out and seek spiritual wisdom. And we have a whole wisdom tradition in the desert, the sayings of the desert fathers and mothers that come from those fathers and mothers who are out alone in the wilderness. So, um, and the other thing, by the way, that happens when you go out to the wilderness alone to be with God, they discovered was that what they believed were the corrupting influences of society weren't simply outside of themselves, but all those things were inside. So they had to wrestle with their demons when they got alone with God. So all of them had to wrestle. When you read the Saints and the Desert Fathers, they're struggling with all the same things that every human being ever struggles with. Anger, judgment, lust, envy, sloth, pride, uh, you name it, uh, they struggle with it just like we do. So, uh, so Benedict in organizing the first Christian community, his whole notion was that this Christian community would support each other on the Christian journey. And almost the rule of Benedict almost reads like scripture. It's a very good spiritual read. And it can be read like scripture in little sections. But he says the life of the monk should be uh, about work and prayer. Uh, prayer and work, ora et labora. And so the monks would have to be responsible for work, and they'd be out the, you know, taking care of the agriculture or whatever tasks that the monastery was involved with to be a self-supporting community. Um, but they would interrupt the hours of the day with prayer. And as church bells began to be designed and built, uh, the gift of the church bell was at the beginning of day, the bells would ring to wake the monks up and call them to the morning prayer. They would ring at mid morning, mid day, mid afternoon, at the time of evening. So the bells would call them back to prayer. This was long before we had you know, portable time pieces. So the hours of the day were marked principally by the sun and moon and seasons and so forth until church bells were created. So. Um, so morning prayer and evening prayer, hinge hours, midday prayer, mid morning, mid afternoon. But the monks uh, did their evening prayer before the evening meal, so they needed a little time of prayer before they would go to bed at night. So they have a very short office called night prayer.
That was, by the way, also the point at which one would do at day's end what we call today an examination of conscience. So you look back over the day and, uh, and you do it to recognize where God was active and at work in your life and where you cooperated with that grace of God and also where you veered off course. That's my language for it, where you got off track in the Christian life. And I always say, for me, the way to spot when I got off track is normally associated with things like anger, fear, uh, guilt. You know, usually I have an emotional reaction to my having veered off course. So if you're trying to live the Christian life, your emotions can help you to notice those kind of things. So um, if you have not experienced monastic prayer like that, it's worth a trip to St. Lionrad or Gethsemane. They're only three hours away driving time. Both have beautiful guest, house, guest houses where you can spend a night, uh, a night or two, or a weekend, and often have retreats uh, that are led at St. Lionrad. And you can often go to the guest house at Gethsemane and schedule your own private retreat. So those are wonderful places to go. If you want a shorter taste, just to know what a sunk office is like, locally, the Dominican sisters at the mother house, you can go for vespers. There's always something beautiful about all women's voices or all men's voices singing together uh, the liturgy of the hour. So, uh, so for us, uh, the takeaway ought to be that, that we live our day uh, so that prayer is an interwoven part of our life. So it's punctuated with prayer is one of the ways I like to describe it. So just like a, a, in a chapter in a book or a paragraph, you don't simply have a punctuation point at the end, but all through the paragraph you discover different forms of punctuation. It might be an exclamation point or a question mark or a comma or a semicolon or a dash or quotation marks. But, you know, a whole sentence or a paragraph gets punctuated in lots of different ways. So our lives should be punctuated with prayer. So if we're conscious of that, we, when we walk out the door, we say a beautiful morning. You know, if we're, if we're conscious of God, we say, God, thank you. That's beautiful. Uh, if we're conscious of God and we run into a difficult circumstance, we say, God, would you give me wisdom? I don't know what to do about this. Holy Spirit, guide me. So naturally, the human heart and mind begin to turn to our Creator, and we punctuate the day with prayer. But I do think that set times are helpful. So it is helpful to have a set time to start our day with prayer. So if, you, if you're not accustomed to doing that, a couple of recommendations. One, find a place in your home or outside your home that is your quote-unquote place that you pray. So make it a, a place for you to go. Uh, I go to a particular place indoors this time of year. I like candle, my candle or my oil lamp. And so I have a place that I go. I know it's my place of prayer. I rarely sit there otherwise. Uh, and I have some sacred symbols that remind me of God. So I also have a place like that on my porch. And in the warm weather, I turn on my water feature and I light my oil lamp. So I have my places that say to me, this is prayer time. I turn my phone on uh, airplane mode so that you know it's not digging with emails and text messages and phone calls and all that, so that the time I have with God uh, is uninterrupted time. So I suggest that you find a place in the town where you can you know, communicate to the family, if you're living with others, this is my time for God, so you know, give it to me, let me be with the Lord for a bit. Uh, and they'll probably, once they see you do it regularly and notice the change, uh, be grateful that you take it. <laughs> and notice when you don't. So, um, so uh, yes, yeah, so I think one should start the day with prayer. I once taught a class on prayer, and I did a survey about prayer, and I asked what was the number one reason people uh, didn't pray. You know what the number one answer was? There's not enough time. That's exactly right. They were too busy for not enough time. And so what I said in reply was, as I was teaching the class, I said, you know, I said, none of us would say that we're too busy to get ready in the morning physically. You know, we shave or put on our makeup or take our shower or, you know, deodorant, whatever we do, we go through this ritual in the morning to get our bodies ready for the day. And most of us would not want to show up in public 
without attending to, to our physical presentation. And that often takes some time. It's not like you do it in two seconds, you know. Uh, so if we're going to make sure that the outside is ready, isn't the inside far more important? You know, don't we want to prepare it interiorly for the day ahead? So I think beginning the day with prayer is so important. And also, the other thing that this teaches me about the structure of hours is that day's end should also bring us back to a recollection of God. So, you know, those principal hinge moments, whether it's when I get home from work or on my way home from work or before I fall asleep at night, I know for myself the hardest part is before I go to sleep at night because I'm so tired, you know, my brain doesn't work as well that late at night. But some people are what I call night people, and you're dead in the morning, but in the night you could pray for an hour, you know, and you feel refreshed. So you also have to ask yourself what works for you. Know? Um, also, for you who are really busy and have many responsibilities, uh, how can you sneak prayer in? Well, one great place to sneak it in I have found in my life is in the car when nobody's with you. Turn the radio off and uh, make it a, a time of conversation with God or the rosary. Uh, you can even talk to God in the shower, you know, as you're showering. For those of you who exercise, if you're walking in the park, that's a great place for me to talk to God. Sometimes I come around the corner and there's somebody there and I've been talking to God out loud. Yeah. You know, so I, I get a little embarrassed, but it's okay. I talk, I talk to their dogs, too. I read their dogs when I ask them in the park. So. Um, and then there's also an office of readings for the monks, which they usually connect with morning prayer which is some in-depth spiritual reading from scripture and usually a uh, sacred writing from the tradition of the church. So monks do spend a lot of time in prayer. Um, if you don't regularly spend any time in prayer at all, uh, dedicated time, um, I would suggest you start experimenting with at least 15 minutes a day. You know, start there. What I found through my own life is that the longer I've gone through life, the more that I need prayer. So used to, I did it because I, I was quote unquote supposed to do it. And at one other point, <coughs> I realized I needed it. And now I realize many times I delight in that time with God. So, you know, there's a progression in it. Um, and there's a famous story about an abbot of a monastery who was asked how much he prayed. And he said, well, you know, normally I do dedicate an hour a day to the Lord in prayer. And he said, but you know, I am the abbot of the monastery and there are times when, you know, the life gets intense and busy and I have many responsibilities and I'm overwhelmed by the demands of the community. And he said, in those times, I will take an hour and a half for prayer. <laughs> so, you know, so the greater the demands, the greater the need for uh, focusing on God in that moment. So, so we make uh, the time of each day. So if we expand out from a day, the other great unit of time for us Christians that defines our life uh, is the week. Sunday, the day of the Lord is the hinged day of the week. So important, by the way, was the day of the Lord and why the day of the Lord? Why was that so important for early Christians and it has been ever since? Because not only was it the day on which God created the universe and brought light out of darkness, but preeminently they celebrated and marked the day of the Lord Sunday, the day of the sun, because it was the day when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So marking the resurrection as the first day of the week as the most important holy day of the year, uh, is a sacred obligation for Catholic Christians. And so serious, by the way, that we're obligated to attend the Eucharist uh, on the day of the Lord uh, or the vigil of the evening before uh, under the pain of the most grave sin without good cause. So we, we cannot lightly miss that central obligation. And in the ancient church, it was so important that everyone in the Christian community be connected to the Eucharistic body of the Lord on the day of the Lord, that the deacons would take to those who were absent because of illness or some grave reason, they would take the body of the Lord to them uh, in their homes so that everyone remained in communion. So Sunday, the day of the Lord, should be marked and set apart and define the rest of the week. 
Now, one of the problems that we run into in the modern world is it no longer defines the world as it once did. And because in the centuries until really the 20th century, uh, there were six days of work, and then you had the day of the Lord, Sunday, uh, from which you rested. And that obligation of rest was universal and serious in Western civilization, except for those who didn't, were not Christian, so our Jewish brothers and sisters, so, and so forth. So foundationally important was it that you have that day of rest, so that the Sabbath rest of the Old Testament was transferred to the day of the Lord, because God knew even at the beginning of human history that we were not created to be uh, workaholics, you know, that we were gonna work seven days a week. And so God had to set the example in Genesis by resting on the seventh day. And he would say, six days you may work, but on the seventh you shall rest. But the commandment of God is greater and deeper than that. He says, not only must you, my people, rest on the seventh day, but all of your male and female slaves, uh, your animals have to rest on that day. All of creation has to rest. And why? Because God himself rested on the seventh day and thus made it holy. So our Jewish brothers and sisters still mark Saturdays, the Sabbath, as their day of rest. Whereas Christians, uh, after the Emperor Constantine, when Sunday was given as a day free from work, began to observe rest on the day of the Lord, on Sunday, the day of resurrection. So, but the principle is essential. We need Sabbath rest. And we also need a day of the week that reminds us that we are creatures and God is the creator and to have a right relationship with God. And in fact, I think it's so important that it structures the rest of the week. And I was uh, many, many years ago, back in the mid 90s, I think it was, I was on an airplane flying to Colorado for my annual retreat. And in the, in the seat in front of me was one of those airplane magazines. And I pulled it out of the pocket. And uh, the title was, A Jewish Family, Modern Jewish Family, rediscovers the value of Sabbath rest. And this modern Jewish family, well, what they had done was what I had begun to do with my so-called day off. Uh, they spent that day doing everything else they didn't do the rest of the week. Laundry, grocery shopping, paying bills, uh, cleaning their car, gassing it up, sort of thing. Now, all the work that they didn't do at work, they did at home uh, on their so-called Sabbath day of rest. And they said they were driving themselves crazy so they made this decision to restore Sabbath rest as a family. You know what they did? They decided, because they're Jewish, so from Friday evening when the sun set until Saturday evening, they dedicated themselves for those 24 hours to doing nothing together as a family but uh, things that were truly creative and life-giving and reconnected them with God, with themselves, and with each other. So they could go to the, they didn't do it the old fashioned way that Orthodox Jews did. You can't walk more than 17 steps in a day or whatever like that. But it was like, you know, things that delighted them. If gardening delighted them, they would garden as a family. Walking in the park did, if going to the art museum did. But, you know, the wife said she didn't cook meals, she didn't clean the house. You know, the husband didn't cut the grass because he didn't like it. You know, so they created a true Sabbath day of rest for those 24 hours. And they said it changed their life. And what they found was they could get all the other tasks that had to be done. Eventually they found out how they could get them done. So for those of you who are old enough to remember, and that's probably a number of you, uh, when I was a child, uh, Sunday was a different day of the week. Nothing was open in Lawrenceburg. Not a gas station or a drugstore was open in Lawrenceburg. If we needed milk for Sunday and we didn't have any in the house, you better get to the South End Grocery by 9 o'clock Saturday night or it was too late. And so with everything shut down, you know, everybody went to church, and you couldn't work the rest of the day, so normally on Sundays, you know, if we did anything, we might take a drive and visit relatives, uh, and just drop by and visit them unexpectedly. Can you imagine doing that today? People would say, what are you doing here? Yeah. So, you know, and then we would always end up, when I was a little child at my grandparents' house, and uh, Grandma always made the Sunday evening dinner, so we always watched uh, The Wonderful World of Disney and the Animal Kingdom, or whatever, Wild Kingdom and, uh, and Africa. It was, you know, those, we watched those two shows, eight or Sunday dinner. And so Sunday was different than every other day of the week. So, so, my, so my encouragement to all of you is,
is if you have let such a discipline slide of having the day of the Lord be a special day that defines the week, I encourage you to try to rediscover that for yourself so that the other days have a different <coughs> dynamic to them. Uh, so that's what the way God created us, I think. All right, beyond the week, uh, we come down to also the thing that I love, one of the things I love most about being Catholic is that we have what we call our liturgical year. So for us Catholics, you know, we define an entire year by going through a cycle of, uh, of liturgical activity. So one person tonight uh, asked me the question, which was a fantastic question. It was like it was set up for me to answer. They said, you know, when we came to Mass on the first Sunday of Advent, it seemed different than it's been. And it was like, that's the idea. So liturgically, in a sense, you should be able to walk into the church, and by the music and the sound and the color and all that, you should immediately sense we're at a different time of the year now. So that's what I love about the liturgical year of the Catholic Church. The center of the liturgical year for us Catholics is what we call the great Paschal Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. <coughs> Sunday or the Easter Vigil, we call those the great three days. And so from uh, Thursday evening, Holy Thursday evening, when we celebrate the Mass of the Lord's Supper, when Jesus gave us the Eucharist, and we do it in a very solemn way on Holy Thursday evening by washing feet and processing with the Eucharist from the church to a place of repose as Jesus left the, the, the Last Supper to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, we enter into the holiest time of the year from that moment when we enter the Holy Thursday Mysteries. Good Friday, the day that follows it, is a day of fast and abstinence. We don't eat any meat that day as Catholics, and unless we reach a certain age in life, or before a certain age, we fast, we eat less food. So there is a discipline about the day. We do not celebrate sacraments on Good Friday normally, unless there is need. So there's no Eucharist anywhere on Good Friday that is celebrated but we mark it with a solemn observance of the passion of the Lord. We proclaim the gospel according to the passion according to John. We venerate the cross. We pray for the needs of the church and the world. And we also now offer Holy Communion at the end of it that was consecrated the evening before at the Mass of the Lord's Supper. So that's the heart of Good Friday. So it's an intense day of communion with Christ who died for us. And Holy Saturday begins with an awareness that we're uh, waiting for the Lord to be risen. So the stillness of Holy Saturday is the, the and that there's an energy unfolding as you move toward the great vigil of Easter. And once darkness falls on Holy Saturday evening, the great vigil of Easter begins. In the ancient church, it began after sunset and continued throughout the night. They kept vigil until the sun rose on Easter Sunday morning. So they would go through the great stories of the Old Testament, the Psalms of the Old Testament, and during the night they would they would bring those to be baptized to the waters of the font and baptize them, and seal them with the oil of confirmation or chrismation. And then they would celebrate a solemn Eucharist, and as, as uh, the sun rose, the Eucharistic prayer would be being proclaimed, and they would receive the body and blood of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the Eucharist on Easter Sunday morning. So it was great all night vigil that unfolded. So by comparison now, we have a very short uh, two and a half hour vigil on, on a Saturday evening. Uh, and then we have services on Sunday morning for Easter Sunday. So that for us, the annual celebration of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Paschal Mystery, is the heart of our liturgical year. Uh, it's like every Sunday is a mini Easter, but we concentrate all of that into the great Sunday of Easter Sunday. But we Catholics, when we get to something that solemn, we can't just do it in 24 hours. So we call the day of Easter act actually is an eight-day period, the octave of Easter. It was all the way until the following Sunday. So the first day in the great day of Easter, the second day in the great day of Easter, the third day, 
So eight full days of the octave of Easter. And then we said, well, we still can't stop celebrating after that. So it actually, from Easter Sunday until Pentecost Sunday, uh, we actually have 50 full days of the great season of Easter. And on the 40th of those, we typically mark his ascension into heaven. And Pentecost marks the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So that follows the timeline of Luke. Now, to celebrate so well such a great mystery, you can't just jump into it either. So the week that precedes uh, Easter is called Holy Week, starting with Palm Sunday, where we commemorate the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. And then on uh, that Palm Sunday, we read the Passion of the Lord, either according to Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and alternates year by year. And the week of Holy Week is an intense spiritual time of readiness for the great true. But again, you know, you can't just jump into Holy Week either, you know. So we actually precede uh, Holy Thursday and the Great Triduum with 40 days of Lent. And for many Catholics who grew up as Catholics, that's probably the time of the year that we intuitively, emotionally connect with the most. It starts on Ash Wednesday when we are marked on our foreheads with ashes in the sign of the cross. And we hear the minister say, uh, remember, you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. Or something along the lines of, turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel, <coughs> repent, believe the good news. So the solemn beginning of Lent marks the time when we ask Catholics to intensify our prayer. You know, so we're going to pray more intently than we do the rest of the year. To engage in works of loving service toward our brothers and sisters in a more intense way. Uh, to pray and fast to let go of things that we don't, uh, that we normally get a great deal of joy from. So we experience an absence that God can fill. So whether that be food or something that we particularly enjoy. And by the way, I think that's what captures Catholics' imagination the most. We have to give something up letting go of something. Uh, but those are the things, by the way, the church says we should be doing every throughout the year anyway. We should be praying and loving others and abstaining from harmful things. So Lent is about kind of redisciplining ourselves or re-intensifying those fundamental spiritual disciplines. And for those who are going to become Catholic, it's an intense period of preparation to be baptized at the Easter Vigil. So, so that 50 days of the Easter season, the 40 days of Lent together, are called the Great 90 Days. And so for us Catholics, that great cycle of preparation for the death and resurrection of Christ and the celebration of the resurrection, this great three months, that 25% of the year, that's sort of the great anchor that anchors the rest of the liturgical year. So there's a second cycle for us that is important. So the great cycle is Jesus' death and resurrection. What's the second cycle focused around? All right, the birth of Jesus, the celebration of his nativity and birth, which took place, uh, which takes place each year on December the 25th, as you all know, Christmas Day. So for us, we don't just celebrate his birth that day, by the way, but we're really reflecting on the mystery of his incarnation, that God became human. So the gospel reading from Christmas Day is the word was flesh and the word became flesh and pitched his tent or made his dwelling among us. But in the evening before at midnight, we do hear the traditional, the evening before you're supposed to hear the preparations for the birth. And really, the mass during the night of Christmas is the one where the traditional Luke Christmas account of the shepherds uh, normally takes place. You can, you can move the scripture readings around, but that's kind of a normal plan. So, and likewise, we can't just jump into such a great mystery of God becoming a human and being born in our world without proper preparation. So this past Sunday we began uh, the season of Advent, uh, four weeks or so, or more or less, to prepare us for the coming of the Lord, not only in his incarnation to celebrate Christmas, but also what we're really doing during the days of Advent we're really kind of readying ourselves. All of us have to meet the Lord someday, face to face. Uh, at the end of the world, if we live that long, but it's probably not going to be the case for most of us. So it will be the end of our life on earth when we meet the Lord face to face. Will we be ready for Him? 
are our hearts eager to see him. Uh, I remember I went to see this gravely ill person in Robertson County, and she was dying, actually, of a terminal illness. And I walked in, and she was very weak, and she looked at me, and she said, I'm waiting for God. And I thought, oh, she was waiting for me to bring the Eucharist. So I said, well, I brought the Eucharist, and so I gave her Holy Communion. And when we finished celebrating communion, she said, I'm waiting for God. And I realized she wasn't just waiting for the Eucharist. She was waiting for God at the end of her life on earth. So, you know, in, in the medieval period, they would always say, remember death. You know, uh, so be aware that you're a mortal being and someday you're going to meet the Lord. And the early Christians, by the way, would have the great prayer, Maranatha, or Maranatha, I don't know you say it correctly, but our Lord come. So the great hope that Jesus who had died and risen from the dead, they were waiting for him to come in glory to greet him again. So the expectation of waiting for him, thy kingdom come, uh, was at the forefront of their consciousness. So Advent is also about getting us ready for the Lord, uh, meeting him, not just at Christmas. So, but there's also a third layer of meaning that's developed. And uh, some of the spiritual writers have written about this. So if we're preparing for Christ's incarnation at Christmas Day, and we're waiting for him at the end of our life, at the end of the world, we also prepare ourselves daily in Advent where the Lord meets us day by day. So where does he come to us daily? And the word proclaimed in the Eucharist and sacraments in the faces of those who need us. Whatever you do for the least, you do for me. So the many different ways that we meet Jesus day by day, Advent is supposed to wake us up to see his face. So it's a beautiful time of year. Uh, it is penitential, but different than the Lent. It's tinted with joy and hope and expectancy in a way that Lent is uh, more, more somber, uh, more serious. So that's what we're in, by the way. The third Sunday of Advent, by the way, Gaudete, Rejoice Sunday, and uh, during Lent we have Laudate, Joyful Sunday. You know, penitential seasons can wear you down spiritually, and so they have these little joyful pauses to celebrate uh, during those uh, preparatory seasons. So if we have them, I don't know if we will or not, you know, you might see rose-colored vestments pop up. Other Bolso is trying to get some for us. That's, any, that's one of his delights. You put the Christmas lights in front of the record, they look beautiful, right? With evil rose vestments. So I like his joyfulness about this thing. So. Um, so that is the second great cycle, but again, you can't just celebrate the nativity of Jesus as incarnation without unfolding it over time. So we also mark Christmas Day over eight days, the octave of Christmas, and it actually goes all the way, at least traditionally, to the Feast of the Epiphany when the Magi appear. And for the Eastern churches, that's a greater feast than Christmas. And even for the Italians, by the way, they call it Little Christmas. So. Uh, that great waiting for January the 6th was the traditional date. Uh, the Christmas season didn't traditionally end until then. So uh, this is my encouragement. I always give these little pastoral encouragements. So Americans love to anticipate things, and then when they come, we're done with it. So, you know, we want to put our you know Christmas decorations up and play Christmas songs after Halloween. And then when Christmas Day comes, we're all tired of it. So we're going to pack all that mess up and put it away. So my encouragement is, you know, don't rush ahead to decorate too early. Have some Advent time before you decorate. It's too late for that now, I know for some of you, but and then, but then keep your decorations up, keep playing Christmas hymns until at least the Epiphany. So the formal ending, by the way, to the Christmas season now is actually the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, which is either the day after Epiphany or a week later, depending upon how the year unfolds. So, and, and the tucked into that season is the Feast of Mary, Mother of God, and uh, the Feast of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and all tucked into the Christmas season. So, it also is a splendid time of year. By the way, was Jesus born on December 25th? No, probably not. We have no clue when he was born. But the Romans had a feast called the Invincible Sun God, uh, and they were in the ancient world that when the days got shorter and shorter, you know, there was this primal human fear that eventually the darkness was going to swallow up the light. And then so when they could gradually realize after the solstice that the days were getting longer now, 
and the sun hadn't been consumed by the darkness, they would have this big pagan festival to the sun god. So, so early on, uh, the Christians had the genius of saying, well, the true light of the world is not the, the physical sun, it's the son of God. So let's celebrate his birth after the winter solstice and get people to quit celebrating the pagan feast of the sun and celebrate Jesus instead. So that's where Christmas came from, actually. So, uh, and I think it's a wonderful, splendid time of year to do that. Now, here's my only caveat. Uh, our liturgical year was designed for all of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere. So the people who have to live down in Australia and New Zealand, you know, it's not quite so pleasant because for them because when we're marking spring and new life and resurrection, all they're, you know, they're going into fall, it's getting cold and dark. Uh, when we're moving into the great feast of Christmas and celebrating Christ the light of the world, they're moving toward the heat of summer and have to sit down and eat Christmas dinner on, on a hot summer day. So, so um, you know, I guess in the ideal world, you know, they could invert the liturgical year, but then they'd be out of connection with the rest of us. So, you know, we have to live with, that's the way God, he became human in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's why our season unfolds in the Northern Hemisphere now. That's, that's where Christianity was born and developed, so our liturgical life flows out of our experience. So you can also see it's, it is intimately connected with the natural cycle of the world. And uh, so why do we keep doing this every single year? Because I always say, you know, God is always working on us, so we're never finished. And so we have to keep pondering these mysteries. It's like circling the beauty of Christ year by year. And the more we circle it, the deeper. It's like a spiral. We're going deeper into the mystery of who God is, who Christ is for us. And uh, I use a comparison. The first time I saw Mount Rainier in Washington State, I almost wrecked my car because I was driving across the George Washington Bridge and it had been cloudy and I hadn't seen it. All of a sudden, the, the clouds opened up. I had a sudden awareness of something giant outside my window. And I glanced over this huge mountain. So, have you seen it? It's giant. So, it's so big, it occupied the whole window. It's like 60 miles away from Seattle. I almost wrecked the car. I thought, what is that? It's a giant mountain. Uh, right here, looming over the city. You know? So, but I went to Mount Rainier. I drove up to as high, as high as the road will go. I hiked around it. I eventually drove my car all the way around the mountain that summer. And yet, as often as I saw it, you know, it was like, it still remained a mystery to me. I could never exhaust its beauty. And so when I think about the liturgical year and circling around the mystery of Christ, it's kind of like we keep circling a mystery that we, that we never finish with, we never exhaust it. So every year as I'm praying with and celebrating the birth of Jesus and his nativity, as always, there's something new that happens. It's new and refreshing every year. So that's what should happen as we deepen our life of faith. All right, so that's how we make a year holy. So we do have sometimes great jubilee years that are more extended, but I won't go into a lot of that tonight. Any questions about any of these things? I'll try to throw in some practical things, too, along the way. So on the eighth day, they do take Jesus to have him circumcised in the temple. And uh, that was the feast before they revised the liturgical calendar. And um, I'm not sure what went into the process of changing that, focusing more on uh, the solemnity of Mary as mother of God. That is a really good question. Well, I think it was because the nuns didn't want to tell you what circumcision was. <laughs> <laughs> They don't want to talk about that. Yeah, let's change that for us. We don't want to talk about that. I agree with those guys. Yeah, that's good. Well, you know, it's interesting because for the Jews, of course, the mark of being God's people for the male Jew is the mark of circumcision. That's the sign in the flesh that God gave Abraham. Which, by the way, that's profoundly symbolic, isn't it? That God would mark his people with a mark in the flesh itself. Our very bodies, our whole our being is marked by God, before God. It's like being um, 
tattooed or something, or branded. You know. Why are women? Well, women didn't have to be subjected to such a ritual, thankfully, in the Jewish tradition. But it's interesting because it was often the mother who determined the, that the child was Jewish because they could trace for sure who the mothers were on the ways before genetic testing. Were they certain about fatherhood? They knew the mother was Jewish. The first covenant is with Noah, by the way. And what's the sign of that covenant? Not circumcision, but the rainbow in the sky. Yeah, the rainbow is the sign. It's the unit. We call that the covenant of God with all humanity. So never again will God full of humanity. But the bow is a protective sign of God's protective care of the whole human family. So it's universal. And from the human family that Abraham is called. There's another covenant, by the way, after Abraham's in the flesh. The third covenant on Mount Sinai. And not inscribed in the flesh, but in tablets. The Ten Commandments, the, the Torah is given. You shall be my God. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Uh, and thus, because I liberated you from Egypt, now therefore in Israel you shall live these commandments. But the prophets began to talk about by the way, a time when God would write that covenant not on tablets of stone but on the heart and give a new spirit, a new breath. And we Christians believe that came in Christ the new covenant in his body and blood thus the Eucharist. The new and eternal or everlasting covenant. Any other questions? Good one. Um, back to the Psalms and the liturgy of the hours. You said the morning canticle was from Zachariah? And the evening canticle is from Mary. They're both at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. There's also a night canticle for night prayer. It's the shortest, the canticle of Simeon. Lord, now you can let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal the other nations and the glory of your people, Israel. That's a good thing to memorize for night prayer, by the way. If you want to say a prayer when you're falling asleep at night. When did the monks start getting ordained and become priests rather than two? Well, it's, okay, when did that happen? It started when, of course, those Christian communities needed priests to serve their needs. So they started ordaining certain members of the community to celebrate Mass and the sacraments for them. But over time, more and more often, more of the community became ordained. So if you go to a place like St. Minrad now, the majority of the monks are priests, but you still have brothers who are not ordained. So that is still kept there. And you have some orders like the Christian brothers who don't have any ordained to this day. I'll also add, by the way, if you want to try to pray some version of the Liturgy of the Hours in a simplified way, the best way to start is, if you don't do it electronically, which you can do, that's the full thing, but I love two little publications. One is called the Magnificat, and the other is called Give Us This Day. What I like about them, they have a very short morning prayer, a very short evening prayer. They have the scriptures of the day for the Mass with a little one-page homily, and then a one-page little reflection on a saint of the day. So if you want to try to start you know, doing morning and evening prayer, including meditating on the readings of the Mass or the Feast of the Day, those are wonderful ways to start praying that way. Which, by the way, the Rosary did grow out of the Liturgy of the Hours, because when uh, lay people in the Middle Ages couldn't read or write and go and follow the monks with 150 psalms, they started praying 150 beats of prayer. So originally Pater Nosters, the Lord's Prayer, 150 times, and eventually broken into decades and alternating the Aves, the Hail Marys. And then, so it evolves over time with a petition, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now that the hour of our death got added at some point. So that it began to be connected with the mysteries of Christ, reflection on his birth and his uh, death and resurrection, 
and very recent in the history of the church, only about 20 years ago with Pope John Paul II, but the life of Jesus. So, so it's a wonderful form of prayer um, that can also help you kind of mark a rhythm to the day and the week. The rosary? No. The liturgy of the hours? Oh, so you could you can find the maggot of the Magnificat or Give Us This Day. There are publications like magazines that you can subscribe to. So you can probably find them at St. Mary Bookstore, and you could buy one and then call the toll-free number and order a subscription. Uh, or you could probably Google them and find the contact information and online or by phone. It, it is online, yes. It is online. And um, in fact, you know, I like to give them sometimes as gift uh, subscriptions to family members especially. So you can order gift subscriptions for people too. So. Laura has a copy of an order form if anybody wants one to order. Mary Jean, Mother Cross from you, Laura would love it. So, yes, oh no, it's a question. Well, I forgot the Pope added the lives of Christ. What, what, what would you Oh, mean? so Pope John Paul II added what we call the luminous mysteries about the life of Christ. So we had joyful about his birth, sorrowful about his suffering and death, glorious about resurrection, and he added luminous about the life of Christ. Thank you. Which I think perfectly. It was waiting to be finished in that way. When I was growing up in school, the noontime, we specifically said that Angelus. Yes, that's a traditional noonday prayer for Catholics. The Angelus is a <laughs> traditional noonday prayer for Catholics. So when the noon bell rang, the Angelus was recited. And that's still not a bad tradition, by the way. And you can do it with his family wherever they Sure, you can do it anywhere. We did it on the playground in our Catholic school when I was growing up for a period of time. So. Do they do that at St. Henry's? Do they do that at St. Henry's? Does anybody have children here? Do they do that on noonday? I'm not sure. Yeah. They do or don't. That's, 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 schedule, they don't that's a good question. They do I don't know. Cecilia. I'm not often in the school at noon, so I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, we have gone past day. One more question, yes. Well, there's a question I thought I gave to Anne, not to eat the Oh, not to eat from the tree of life. Um, that we don't, they don't, they don't use the word covenant to describe that, that first command. Uh, by the way, that wasn't the first command in the book of Genesis. You know what the first commandment of God to humanity was? Go, be fertile, fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. The first commandment that God gives humanity. Humanity has fulfilled that one. What, six billion of us on planet Earth? Yeah. That's one commandment we have followed some of that. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we'll start with the brand new year, January the 9th, the Holy Spirit. I hope you all enjoy a great Christmas uh, celebration. So let's close with the glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now.